Tell me what defunding the police department really is. Well, let me tell you right now. First of all, defunding and dismantling police departments is not only dangerous, it's insane. And how any reasonable person thinks this is a policy solution? And by the way, they've been defunding police departments for years in our major cities. Every single major city is short police officers. They don't have enough to handle their call volume. You're seeing crime already going up in all our major cities. I think you just saw L.A. has found that they have doubled their murder rate in like one week from the week prior. Right here in Houston, our murders are up 48 percent. They're seeing a similar trend in New York because we don't have the police officers in place to handle it. But what's interesting is when you really drill down on policy with them and say, you know, I I don't want to hear platitudes and I don't want to hear, oh, we're going to go to a community centric policing. I want to know if someone sticks a gun in someone's face tomorrow after you've dismantled us, who is coming? And they don't have an answer. And in fact, they had a Minneapolis councilwoman on the news the other day who said, well, if you expect a police officer to come out when your house is being burglarized and someone's robbing you, well, that's just your privilege. Excuse me? That, that's a privilege that every American has in this country, to call the police when something bad has happened to you. But what's really going on here is this is a larger strategy. They are pushing the Overton window further to the left so that they can say, hey, we want to dismantle. We want to take away, even though only 16 percent of the population even supports that in a recent poll. But what they can do is if they push that so radical, it starts to become just a little bit acceptable in people's minds, and then they'll settle for now, for now, for just defunding the police and putting more money into social programs while police officers continue to fall behind. We can't keep up with the calls that that are on the board right now, and our response times are already through the roof. Well, I think they've pushed the Overton window. I mean, Black Lives Matter now is, is mainstream. Black Lives Matter is fine. There's no problem. They shot six cops in Dallas. What are you talking about? They're mainstream. They're not mainstream. Read their own website on what they actually want. They're not mainstream. And yet you're seeing them now in schools. You're seeing them now just in communities saying, I'm with Black Lives Matter. You're seeing all kinds of people. I would say celebrities and media, but we already know that they're with Black Lives Matter. But they've mainstreamed them. This is a dangerous Marxist group. And, and, and you know what? It's become a popular hashtag on Twitter, right? You know, de- defund the police, all right? And all the Hollywood elites are jumping on and all the, you know, the, the politicians that want to jump on the bandwagon. But guess whose communities this hurts the most? Our low-income communities. Our black and brown communities are going to be impacted by this because, you know, folks with means are, are, are neighborhoods that have more money. Like, let's say that L.A. council member who, although she's calling to defund the police, she still has a private police force that is coming out to her house to make sure she stays mm-hmm. protected. But where there is violence mm-hmm. in our communities, there is going to be that's the communities that are going to be impacted by all of a sudden the police being limited on their resources or dismantling the police. Now, who are they going to call when they need help? Is a social worker going to come out when they're robbed at gunpoint or when their spouse has beaten them within an inch of their life? The truth is, if you really get out there and you speak to the business owners and the hardworking, law abiding people in our community, they want more police officers. They don't want less. So what do you take on Seattle, where they gave up a precinct last night, and an important one? I, I, I think what do you make of that? It, it, this is complete anarchy, and there's really no better. It, and it was the same as when the mayor in Minneapolis decided to pull all the police officers out and allow them to burn a police station. You start giving protesters, or I'm sorry, you start giving rioters, and you start giving anarchists an inch, they're going to take a mile. And it completely erodes the rule of law in our country. And at some point, somebody is going to need to stand up and say, no, this is not acceptable. This is not who we are as a society. But as you said, as some of these views become more and more mainstream, you're going to see more things like that. Right here in Houston, they just dropped charges on over 600 people who broke the law during the protests here. And what kind of message is that sending to future protesters? Go ahead and do what you want because there's no consequences for your actions. And it also exposes a deeper concern that we have across this country of activist DAs and activist judges who are all too happy to keep this revolving door going and be light on people. And we're going to all suffer the consequences. 
This is, and I think that it's no coincidence that George Soros has been funding all of those uh, uh, attorney um, uh, attorney generals and uh, uh, in states and all of the, all of the prosecutors for their reelection. He has taken the most radical and put them in, and those are the ones that are releasing most of the people and saying, I'm, I'm going to drop all charges. I mean, in St. Louis, the prosecutor dropped all of the charges. There, there, there was a former cop killed there, and they just dropped all of it uh, in, uh, in any looting or any rioting. Is this why we're seeing a 250% increase in L.A. of, of uh, violent crime? Yes, absolutely. We have an activist DA that was funded by George Soros right here in Harris County for Houston. And we've seen our murder rate up 48 percent. Aggravated assaults are up 23 percent. We have violent crime up in double digits. But, but here's my favorite, and, and this is what really gets me, is that they are being light on violent gun-toting felons. So that while we have a national discussion going on about gun laws— we're not even enforcing the ones we have now. They want to take them from the law-abiding folks while they're asking to defund the police, by the way. But we're not even holding people accountable when we are catching violent felons in possession with a gun. She is currently giving out probation like candy to those caught in possession of firearms when they're already a convicted felon. And I'm just saying, when is someone going to point out the hypocrisy in all of that? So, Joe, let me ask you uh, one more question. When we were when we were going through this COVID nonsense, we saw cops. Uh, some of them didn't seem to care. Others really were hurt by doing their job, but they were going after people who were protesting and uh, who just wanted to go back to work. And some of them weren't enforcing it. Some of it. Some of them were. The problem in our country is we are not protecting and defending the Constitution of the United States. If we would just do that, all these problems will go what would go away. If we just started respecting the Constitution, did the, did, did the police officers at all recognize that mainly a lot of the people that really support police officers and always have felt a little betrayed by some police officers during COVID? I mean, I think that's a fair assessment for some places. Uh, listen, the overwhelming majority of folks in this country, they love, support, and respect police officers. And one of the things we did right here in Houston is when our uh, elected county judge decided that she was going to put in a draconian mask order with a criminal penalty, I immediately put out a letter to our officers saying, you have discretion, discretion, discretion. We were not going to allow her to erode the trust that we have built that we've taken decades to build with our community and stop hardworking, law-abiding people that were just out for a walk in the park and ask, is your child 11 years old? Why doesn't he have a mask on? Or why are you opening your business without people with masks on? We weren't going to be put in that position. We've worked too hard to get where we are. But I think it's become commonplace for, for other politicians to blame police officers for all the ills of society. We know that violence is what we need to stop in our communities in order to reduce police-involved shootings, in order to reduce use of force incidents. And what causes violence in our communities? Bad schools, lack of opportunities, no job opportunities. And if people started really looking at it and admitting their own failures of, hey, we have failing schools in our inner cities, there's not enough opportunities for folks, maybe we could actually start making a difference in their lives. But it's much easier for politicians to just say, it's all the cops' fault, they're all racist, they're the cause of all your problems. Joe Gamaldi, uh, he's vice president of National Fraternal Order of Police. It's good to have you. Uh, and uh, please pass on uh, my thanks to all those who wear blue uh, for what they're putting up with now. I, I don't think I could, but God bless all of them. Thank you so much. Will do, Glenn. Thank you so much for having me on.